Welcome back. So we're now talking about that part of the course that has to do with uh, the secret of life is defiance. And as an interlude, a tangent, we needed to introduce statistical mechanics. And my reason for wanting to introduce statistical mechanics was as the basis of computing the entropic force due to force extension of DNA. And so you know, we in order to pull that off, um, even though it's it's interesting. I mean, when we when we pull on DNA, you know, what we're doing is we're 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 basically pulling out the wrinkles. We're pulling out the fluctuations, and um, and you know, in some sense, that's that's a dynamical process. But in ter in fact, the the rate at which we pull with the optical trap is so slow in comparison with the period of vibrations of the DNA, it's effect, the DNA itself is effectively in equilibrium with the surrounding heat bath all the time. So at any rate, we want to use statistical mechanics. And what I'm going to do here is going to introduce uh, the probably the most elemental case study that you can think of, which is the two-state system. And nicely, we'll, we'll take advantage of the example of ion channels as a, as a really cool uh, two-state system. So what's the story? The story is that the cell is comprised of a variety of different compartments. As you see in the bottom case, which I think is the most glaring one, we have organelles such as the mitochondria, such as the ER, such as the Gold, Golgi, the nuclear envelope, peroxisomes, you know, we can go on and on and on with this. And at the end of the day, the, the different organelles are separated from the the surrounding medium by membranes. The cell itself is surrounded from the external world by membranes. And the kinds of questions that we'll consider in that context are um, how, do, how do things get across those, those membranes? And one way to get a sense for this is to note the wide range of permeabilities. Now, earlier when we talked about frogs, I introduced the linear relationship between flux and the concentration difference across the membrane. The functional form of that was J is equal to, J the flux is equal to P times delta C, where P is the permeability. The units on the left-hand side of that, I have J, which is number uh, per area or volume per area per time. Like if I'm thinking about water flow across the membrane, then the, the flux is volume, so cubic meters per meter squared per second. And the right-hand side has units of number or volume uh, per volume, number per volume. Um, and so what this means is that the permeability itself has units of length per time. That may sound a little weird, but one way you might conceptualize why those are the units is, is like if I'm thinking about water flow, then the, the units are actually, or the, the thing that's going on is I have volume per area per time which has units of length per time. What I want you to notice here is that we have like 12 orders of magnitude difference in permeability. This makes me think about the question of, you know, what are the largest extremes in material response? How many orders of magnitude difference are there in material response if we think about the, the various materials out in the world? And so, you know, a, a good example is viscosity. Viscosity can vary by many, many, many orders of magnitude depending on temperature, you know, and just a, a sort of trivial example of that that you can see in your kitchen is if you've solidified your honey, it's up in some, uh, you know, let's say you make it cold, you could put it in the freezer, and, and then you measure the rate at which it flows, and then compare that to what happens after you put that same bottle of honey into uh, boiling water, and you'll see that the flow rates are really, really very different, so the viscosity is varying over um, a wide range of, of values. Here, um, oh, and I, and I should mention, I think if I remember correctly, that there's in electrical conductivity, there's something like 30 orders of magnitude difference between the best insulator and the best conductor. So, you know, huge range. What we note here is that water is very permeable across the cell membrane, but particular uh, ions such as sodium, potassium, et cetera, they have very, very low permeabilities. The cell solution to that conundrum, or I should say maybe the cell solution to that good aspect of the lipid bilayer membrane is that it has proteins that transiently change the permeability. 
what I mean by that is that the, the ion channels open. They open in response to some sort of stimulus. And the opening is usually temporary. And in so doing, they change the permeability of the membrane system because now ions are able to transport across the membrane uh, readily during the time that the channel is open. So note that there is a variety of driving forces. When I talk about driving forces, what I mean is that there's different ways to activate the channel. On the left, you see the case where there's a voltage, a change in the voltage, and in, in, that, in response to that, the channel will open. The middle cases are really exciting for me because we'll talk later about allosteri. So this is the notion that a, a ligand can bind onto the channel and in response the channel will open or close. You know, it could go either direction. But that's an allosteric conformational change where a ligand binds and that leads to a conformational change. And then on the right-hand side you see tension-gated ion channels. So how do we know about ion channels? So one of the ways is, is really the first example of a single molecule biophysical measurement where as shown in the upper right, you take a patch of membrane by using a pipette with some suction pressure, and then you insert that excised piece of membrane into a solution. There's electrodes that are deposited inside of the, the, the pipette. And then either by putting in ligands or by applying voltage or by applying suction pressure, which gives a tension, what happens is that the ion channel will open and the kind of current traces you will achieve are shown on the lower left. Let me give you a better example of that. So in the upper left here, what I'm showing you is a voltage gated, this is a trace from a voltage gated ion channel. And you can see that it goes between closed and open, closed and open, closed and open. And depending upon the voltage, the fraction of time spent in the open or the closed state will, will change. And you see that in the right hand side. So at the very top, you know, at, at the applied voltage of minus 125 millivolts, then most of the time it's closed. Uh, at the bottom, uh, you see that much of the time now it's open. If we wanted to compute the open probability, the way we would do that is to compute the fraction of time that it spins open divided by the total time. That gives us P open. Now if we do that for each value of the applied voltage, what we'll find is a curve like that one shown on the left, <coughs> where what we see is that um, depending upon the, uh, the applied voltage, the fraction of time spent in the open state changes. You know, and that's, that makes a lot of sense. So the question that we're going to pose is can we, from first principles, compute this particular curve? Can we actually, by thought, by using what we know about the Boltzmann distribution, can we can we actually understand why there's this particular functional form? And uh, I just wanted to say as an aside that I think it's interesting, you know, like it's, it's one thing to have an abstraction like this upper left where, you know, we've schematized the open and closed uh, segments by this telegraph signal, which is, you know, this perfect rectangular array of open and closed fragments. But, you know, the reality is, as you see here, is that the data is much more jiggly and it raises the question of how are you going to decide for certain of these little um, these little spikes? You know, does that qualify as an opening or not? What we did here is we segmented and we thresholded, and the thresholding is based upon did you cross that dotted line, the dotted red line? If you did, then we're going to say that we attribute that to a momentary uh, transient change, and we measure the width of that. So those those guys contribute. Um, so I'm not going to say much about the ligand-gated channels now. I wanted, I wanted to just say a few words about mechanosensitive ion channels because I think that they're a really cool example of what I often refer to as these experiments to change your life for. Why? Because of this really beautiful paper by Eduardo Peroso and Boris Martinak, uh, Anna Cloda, and um, Marian Cortez. So this paper is of the variety where, you know, when I learned about this, I was like, wow, I, I really have to think about this system. Uh, I'd already been sort of the rails had been greased because I, I knew Doug Reese at Caltech who had solved the structures of these proteins and it just seemed really interesting the phenomenology that I'm going to show you on this next view graph. So the, the key point is shown in the upper right. So what's, what's plotted here is the probability of being open of the channel as a function of the, the suction pressure in the pipette 
for our purposes, you can think of that as uh, instead as the tension in the membrane. So the x-axis gives you the tension in the membrane. The y-axis gives you the probability of being open. Notice that it runs between 0 and 1. So that means at low tension, the thing's closed. At high tension, the channel's open. And the thing that caught my eye, the reason that this struck me as so interesting, is that there's three curves, and the three curves correspond to different lengths of phospholipid. So phospho phosphatidylcholine with 16 carbons in the main chain, 18 or 20. This, this belies the way that often structural biology will represent membrane proteins. And what I mean by that is, you know, if we look at the cover of a journal, we might see a structure of the channel of interest as a series of alpha helices and beta sheets and things like that. But the representation of the membrane will just be as two horizontal lines. And yet this really shows that the, the channel cares about those um, about those lipids and it cares about the environment and you know we actually I should say Paul Wiggins worked out a really really nice theory of this um, in the early 2000s that that I think really gives a very plausible hypothesis for how this gating works um, and and I think it's it's in a way quite profound actually so um, so I, I want to just comment, you know, this is really an aside, but it's a very important aside for me. And that is that many, many examples of systems that we're going to care about involve either the, well, let's say it, they involve the performance of work or the investment of energy. And, you know, the classic example of this is shown in the upper left. This is the apparatus used by Joule. You can see, if you look carefully, the box has a thermometer in it and has two paddle wheels or two paddles, and as that thing turns, it heats up the water. And so what Joule was able to do is to measure the so-called mechanical equivalent of heat, the idea being that as the weight lowers, there's a certain amount of work done, that's converted into heat as this thing uh, turns around. And, um, and what I wanted to say on the right-hand side, upper right, is that in many ways we can think of the clever modern apparatus as really corresponding to the lowering of a weight. And, uh, and in the bottom, you know, I'm going to come back to the, the ATP consumption as really one of the keys to defiance. And what I want to say is that, you know, for me personally, I'm not speaking for anyone else, it's strictly subjective, but I'm always interested in can I find a way to conspire to remove ATP consumption and replace it either with the compression of a prist piston or alternatively the lowering of a weight. And the reason is because then I can control the amount of energy delivered, and it's very explicit where that energy consumption is in the, the problem. And so for these mechanosensitive channels, I just wanted to say that the idea here is that um, we can think of the, the tension applied on the, the edges much like the springs in a trampoline. So, you know, when the channel opens, what happens is those weights get lowered, and, um, and that's going to show up in the free energy that we would write down and that's the driving force. The bigger the weights, the larger the tension, the more probable it will be that these channels will be open. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to transition to um, my iPad here, and we will uh, we'll think about this from a concrete quantitative uh, form. So let's see if this is going to work. Looks like it will, which is good. So, uh, so here, here's the deal. So we articulated uh, the statistical mechanics protocol. So the first thing we do is we write down the states. So I'm going to start by writing down the closed state of the channel, which I you know, iconize by this little cartoon, badly drawn cartoon. So let me do a little better than that. There's a closed state. There's an open state. And... You know, those are my states, and that's the whole reason that I wanted to do this ion channel, is because this is a two-state system. It's really like the simplest thing we can do in statistical mechanics. The next thing we want to do is we want to write down the energies, and I'm just by fiat going to declare that I'm going to give a name called epsilon closed to the uh, the closed state, and energy epsilon open to the open state, and I'm going to note that in principle. Both of these can depend upon the driving force. So both change with the driving force. 
And when I say driving force, what I have in mind is, you know, i.e. the voltage, the tension, or the ligand concentration. Those are all ways that I can tune the driving force and tune the difference between these two energies. The next piece in the statistical mechanics protocol is the multiplicity. That is to say the number of different ways that the state of interest can occur. For this case, the answer is one. In other words, there's one closed state, there's one open state. Later, when we think about ligand receptor binding, when we think about DNA pooling, there's going to be many, many states that correspond, many, many different versions of a given microstate. So, for example, when I'm pulling DNA, there's many ways to have a, a polymer chain of length L. And we will try to represent that in some sort of a coarse-grained way later. And then finally, the statistical weight. That's the last piece in the puzzle. Statistical weight. And that's going to be equal to e to the minus beta epsilon closed. I'm going to introduce some new, new notation here. That's space saving and, and time saving, epsilon open, where I define beta as 1 over kBT. So I'm going to use this very often throughout the rest of the term. So beta for me is, is usually going to refer to 1 over kBT. So now I can write the probability of being open. P open is given by... The numerator has the, the statistical weight of the open state, and the denominator has the statistical weight of all of the states. That's it. I can always rewrite this as 1 over 1 plus e to the minus beta delta epsilon, where delta epsilon is equal to epsilon closed minus epsilon open. And that's it. I mean, this thing is our result. And if I plot, make a plot of, here's one, if I make a plot of P open versus delta epsilon on this axis, it's going to do exactly like we saw on the, the curves um, that, that we saw in the data. Okay, so note that we have a very strong prediction for the nature of the open probability um, and I think I want to I want to go back to the, the earlier slide just to show you uh, if we look here notice down uh, by my my shoulder you know over right over here <laughs> So there you see that they've written uh, data of the form P0 equals P max 1 plus X uh, so slash 1 plus X alpha P1 half minus P. So this is what we just derived. I mean, I, I wrote it as P open is equal to 1 over 1 plus E to the minus beta delta epsilon. So, you know, I'm going to say with quotes, we did better than them because we know what this alpha thing is. It's uh, 1 over KBT. And the, the P1 half... Um, minus p is is basically telling us that um, that delta epsilon has got a has got a the, maybe the way that you you could think of it is that we could write delta epsilon as uh, epsilon op uh, closed minus epsilon open minus tau delta a where tau is the tension that's going to correspond in our case so you know I maybe should have written that down earlier but um, notice that the tension at which the exponent becomes zero is really important. That's the half point, the half saturation point. In other words, when the closed state and the open state have the same energy, then that corresponds to delta epsilon is zero, and that means the probability of being open is a half. That's always going to be true with these two-state systems, is that there's a midpoint. The midpoint is when the two effects balance each other perfectly. For example, ligand receptor binding. When we think about ligand receptor binding, there will be a point at which the probability of the receptor being occupied is exactly equal to one-half, and there the interpretation will be that's the point at which the binding energy is exactly equal to the entropy lost when the ligand comes and binds onto the receptor. So this is my, my little toy example of, uh, of ion channels as a two-state statistical mechanical system.
And given this, we're now ready to look at the statistical mechanics of DNA pooling.